Welcome back to the Tinkerage. I watch a lot of YouTube videos, mostly about making, and there's so many topics covered, so many different types of making. There's so many videos that t teach us how to use all sorts of equipment, big equipment, dangerous equipment, and often these come with the disclaimers saying don't try this at home. But of course, you know, sometimes we want to try things. We want to do things. How many woodworkers would be distraught if they had to give up their table saw? Now, there are some good safety videos out there. There are people who talk about safety uh, a great deal, and they do an excellent job. One topic that is even less commonly covered than shop safety is first aid kits. I can only think of three videos that I have seen in the last couple of years that talks about first aid in the shop environment. One of those is a tips video from Jimmy DeResta in which he has a, a small first aid tip. One of those is a rather gory video uh, from Alex Steele, uh, very much in Alex trademark style. There's an excellent video from Andy McClellan, the Gosforth Handyman, uh, which I'll link in the description down below, that talks about first aid kits. Now, I'm not going to try and replace those. I, 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 like to think this is going to be a supplement but I'll, I'll give a disclaimer that disclaimer is I'm not a paramedic I'm not a trained first aid teacher I, I don't actually currently have an up-to-date first aid certificate but I do have a lot of experience probably close to 40 years experience of first aid training and some of that training to a, a reasonably high level what we describe perhaps as basic emergency medical technician level some of my training has involved being able to improvise, uh, to work in the outdoors. I certainly am not giving any advice that could be uh, taken as gospel, particularly when it comes to the work environment. If you are watching this and you are a, a professional maker in some way, and you are employed or you are an employee, there are certain legislations, particularly in the UK, about first aid first aid at work, requirements for kits, requirements for the numbers of first aiders. You need to check with a reputable company and ideally get some training. And that's something I would recommend for everyone. There are courses that run as a minimum of kind of sort of two or three hours. They'll teach you the basics of first aid, how to save somebody's life in a difficult situation, the things that you need to do, being aware of danger, how to check to see if somebody is unconscious, for example. How to deal with them if they are unconscious and perhaps not breathing. How to deal with a trauma of some sort. Now, most first aid training falls into the category that my father, who was a paramedic, and he ran a first aid training company. And one of the scenarios he would describe in most of the first aid training he did was that it was Tesco first aid. Most First aid training is about dealing with somebody in a situation where good quality medical help is only a few minutes away. It's about keeping them alive long enough for trained medical professionals to get there and to take over. Now, one of my father's specialities and something that I've had a fair bit of training in is outdoor first aid. Situations where an ambulance isn't a few minutes away. Now, that I think is probably not too dissimilar to many workshop environments. And that's because quite often we work with dangerous tools and we're on our own. There are obviously things that we can do to mitigate. Annie McClellan made a good point about always keeping the phone handy and charged and being able to use it one-handed and being able to call for help. But there are other things we need to think about. One of the key things is first aid kits. Now I have here just some of the first aid kits that I have. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a few. Uh, keep, we have two cars, there's one in each car. I have some kit, but this is an old trauma bag. This is kept with kind of outdoor kit as kind of stock up. We have a box that's kept near to our back door. It's very quick to get to from any part of the house or from the garden, and that is something that everyone in the house knows where it is. And this particular one, as you can see, is quite clearly labelled first aid, green with a white cross on it. We have a box in the kitchen 
with plasters. And that's what we use most of the time. The things in a first aid kit are things that are going to tackle more serious situations. Now, there is a limit to what any first aider can cover. A paramedic has very specific training, has very specific equipment. It's not the sort of thing that one would have around the house or around the workshop. A first aid kit is something that every person should have in their workshop, in my opinion. This is my workshop kit. Now, I've made a little adjustment. I, I noted about this in one of my vlogs a few weeks ago, and Steve Maker commented that it wasn't really clear enough. I've put a little cross in it. I haven't yet decided where its final home in here is going to be. But when I do, every person in the family is going to know where that is. And it's going to be something where it can be easily found and easily got to. Now, those are quite fancy bags. You don't need fancy bags. And McClellan uses a pink washing powder tub. Bright, easy to open. This is uh, one of my father's old ones. Uh, this is just one he kept, not in the car. I can't remember where he kept this. I still keep it up to date. It's got a few things in it. It's a waterproof tub. It's labeled first aid kit. It's something that can be tucked away quite easily just about anywhere. You can buy first aid kits already made up. You can buy first aid kits that are small enough to fit on a belt. This is probably the smallest first aid kit that I've got that I've ever bought. Um, it's not designed to fit on a belt. There are ones that are about half the size of this. They carry enough things in them that can be worn on, say, a tool belt. So if you're, for example, a, a carpenter and you're working up some scaffolding, you've got enough in there to treat yourself if you're working on your own and you have an injury, or perhaps to treat somebody near to you. First aid kit, of course, is no good if it's nowhere near. And that's one of the reasons why I have so many first aid kits. What should you have in your first aid kit is something that is often debatable. In the work environment, there are guidelines as to what people should have. In the workshop environment, you need to think about what it is you do, what sort of injuries might you get. If you are dealing with pallet wood, you're not the sort of person who likes to wear gloves, then maybe having some forceps handy, maybe some old eyebrow tweezers, is going to be a, a good thing to do. If you're predominantly working with wood, then splinters are probably going to be quite common. Small cuts are probably going to be not uncommon. But if you're working with sharp tools, there's your greatest risk. My table saw fits underneath here. That's probably the most dangerous piece of equipment that I have, not the only one. I have circular saws, I have planes and planers, uh, routers. All of these can cause quite nasty injuries. And if that's the sort of thing you're dealing with, that sort of trauma is not necessarily going to be handled by something that's designed to just deal with a few scratches. It's useful to have, I think, something that can deal with immediate blood loss. If you cut yourself badly, then applying pressure. If possible, raising, if you've cut your arm or your hand, raising that up above your heart, it's going to reduce blood flow. Applying pressure, not necessarily direct pressure, that can be possible. If you have something in the wound, that might not be possible. Applying pressure around the wound, maybe with something else, uh, like a bandage, can help with that. It might be indirect pressure, actually finding a, a pulse point and squeezing on that. That can reduce the blood flow sufficiently that it can clot. And if it's a relatively minor trauma, that might be sufficient for you to then walk back into the house and get some help from somebody in the house or from somebody else, a neighbour, or maybe to call an ambulance. If the wound's more severe, then just squeezing it may not be enough. Now, there are some quite advanced things nowadays. And he talked in his video about clotting agents, sponges that are able to clot developed mostly for the military, for surgical use. They promote clotting, even in quite severe wounds. And some of them are fantastic in how they do. But they're not readily available. They can be got. They're not cheap, but there are things that are maybe not quite so good, but are beneficial. Now, in my workshop kit, one of the things that I have, and I have several of these, are, is a field dressing or shell dressing. 
This is the sort of thing that's issued to the military. They're designed to be accessed very easily. You can tear this open with your teeth and one hand. And they're designed to be able to stop this quite severe trauma. It's a thick, absorbing bandage. It can be tied on very, very easily. Now, I have one inside my first aid kit. But as I have a couple of other different ones, one of the things that I'm thinking of actually doing, I was thinking about this the other day after a comment that somebody else made. I'm going to tag a bit of Velcro on the back of this. And I'm actually going to put it on the side of my table saw. I'm going to take another one and using just a bulldog clip, I'm going to screw that clip onto the lower half of my door. Now, this is a very small workshop. My door is just over arm's reach away. If I was to fall over, I'd probably hit the door. I want that in arm's reach of the floor. And that's then something that I can grab and I can look to stop bleeding as quickly as possible. Now, other things that I have in my first aid kit. Now, I do have things like some eye wash pots. These are sterile saline solution. If I get something in my eye, I can rip a tab off, squirt it into my eye, and hopefully wash out whatever it is that's gone in there. Obviously, eye protection helps. Eye protection is likely to do it. But if you're like me, I bet there are times where you forget to put your eye protection on when perhaps you should have it. I've got a, a selection of bandages, tape. I find kind of uh, zinc oxide type tapes, rough tapes, uh, tend to be better in a workshop environment than smooth tapes. I have bandages, I have gloves. Now, gloves are particularly important, obviously, if you're perhaps a car first aid kit. I'm not going to worry if I've cut myself. I know that I haven't got anything that I can't. Hmm. Can I catch anything for myself? No, of course I can't. It can be nice to have gloves for somebody else if they're treating you, because most of us don't like getting blood on our hands. I've got wipes, I've got plasters, elastoplasts, band-aids. I've got little antiseptic wipes. I also have sutures. Andy, in his video, talks about this in a little bit more detail. And I do recommend, I'll link it below, and I do recommend you go and look at that. If you're using power tools, some sort of heavy-duty trauma dressing should be part of your first aid kit. If you're a blacksmith, I would hope that most blacksmiths have a supply of water in the case of burns. If a burn is more severe, then there are sort of burn treatments available. And with all preparedness, learn how to use these things. Learn the basic principles. You don't necessarily have to go on a first aid course to know the basic principles of dealing with a burn is to run it under the affected area, under cold water, running water, for as long as possible. We often joke about health and safety and health and safety gone mad, but there is nothing wrong with looking at your work environment and deciding for yourself what is the most likely severe injury I could get. If I'm working with power tools, cuts and tears, if I'm working with hot things, burns, scalds, it's not difficult to decide what those things are. Then do some research, work out what the most appropriate thing to have. What do I need and how can I make it handy? It might be like many other people, you have multiple first aid kits spread around. If you're working, it's common for people working uh, up tight. Tree surgeons, arborists will often carry a first aid pack on them. They're hanging around in a harness, getting back down to the floor to go then get to the van, the truck to get a first aid kit. It's not going to happen. Having something close by is important. If you're working on your own in your workshop, Keeping something near to the places where you're most likely to get injured is a good thing. You don't have to have all of your first aid kit in all of your first aid materials in one box. Separating them out, keeping your plasters in maybe a little tub. It can be something like a lunchbox Tupperware. Now, something that is becoming more and more commonly talked about again, something that went out of fashion for a very long time, a tourniquet. Now, tourniquet is a means of obstructing blood flow. They're particularly useful as a last resort. It should be a last resort 
in the case of severe trauma. Now, there are a lot of myths around tourniquets, and that some things are effective and some things aren't. I have a, a tourniquet here. It's a very short tourniquet. This is designed actually for putting cannulas in or taking blood from a patient. It's designed to go around an arm. It's designed to restrict blood flow so that veins will bulge and make it easier to get a needle into them. It's no good in a trauma situation. Now, I don't have a tourniquet. It's something that I am going to consider getting. And he talks about how to improvise one uh, using some old material and a stick, you know, what's called a windless tourniquet in his video. And that is something that's not difficult, but you do have to think about how you do it. Tourniquets work best when they're wide. When you see in films people using telephone cord, that doesn't work. A, a tourniquet will, when applied, creates pressure down through the tissue. And it works in essentially a cone. And the narrower the tourniquet is, the shallower that cone is going to be effective over. And what you need is something that's going to go through as much tissue as possible because the arteries, the arterial flow is generally quite deep in uh, a system. Now, it's not difficult to improvise. People talk about using belts. Leather belts are no good because they don't twist. This is a just quick release belt that I have. Uh, it's big enough to go over my thigh. And that's important. Tourniquets should only be used on extremities. And only four of them shouldn't be used on your head. There was a survey done many years ago by one of the British uh, reco road recovery organisations. I can't remember if it was the AA or the RAC. And they queried people about the use of tourniquets. And a significant number of people said they would use a tourniquet for a head injury. That is something that should never, ever happen. Now, something like a belt can be applied quite easily. It's quick release as well. And even then something, I have a number of these sort of, what someone's called paramedic shears, uh, tough cut shears, cut through coins, all sorts of things, great for cutting through seat belts. Something like that in my workshop can be put in a screwdriver. Something that's not great twist that round and then it needs to be secured. That will restrict blood flow. If you can feel a pulse on the extremity side of a tourniquet, it's not working. I've seen several articles in the news about people using things like bungee cords. I keep bungees in here in the Tinkerich. They're very, very useful. They're too narrow to be used sort of certainly singly. If you were going to have to improvise using bungees, you'd need to wrap multiple times in order to get a, a, an effectively wide tourniquet, which would apply then a cone of pressure deep enough. Tourniquets can lead to, of course, damage. Uh, it's very important that you perhaps learn how to use them, uh, understand that a tourniquet shouldn't be left on for a long period of time. Mo a lot of tourniquets, if you buy them from Amazon, uh, some of them are marked with a little white place with, written with time. Many years ago, people would carry in their first aid kits if they were using tourniquets. Uh, this is again not uncommon in the military, uh, something like a sharpie. And you'd write T and the time on their forehead so that people could see that a tourniquet has been applied and know how long it's been applied for. A tourniquet that's been on for too long, it's then released, can cause problems. Ultimately, they are meant as a last resort only. If you're dealing with things like table saws, chainsaws, knowing how to apply a tourniquet, having one handy, could be a lifesaver. But one big message that I want to people to carry from this chat, and I appreciate this has been a long video, preparedness is important. Know what the risk that you face that is most likely to cause you severe harm. Don't assume that because you're experienced or particularly talented, that you're never going to hurt yourself. Complacency is dangerous in the workshop. Get some training. There are many organisations, certainly in the UK, St John's Ambulance, British Red Cross, run training sessions, and it's not difficult to get on those. Yes, there can be a cost involved. Sometimes if you look around, they might be free. There's certainly plenty of books available. 
reading a book is not a substitute for going on a course with a good quality trainer, but it might just be the one thing that you read in that book that will help you get some first aid kit. You don't necessarily have to go out and buy a big box and fill it uh, bought already filled. That can be very expensive. Buy little bits at a time. Know how to improvise. Tape, super glue. They're not necessarily the best way of dealing with things. They are a way of dealing with things. Belt and a uh, carabiner or, or something to create a windless tourniquet. Not ideal, but things that you can learn about. Getting good quality dressings, getting burn dressings, things like plasters. These things are easily things that you can get hold of. The non adherent wound dressings, they're easily bought. Steri strips, suture strips, very effective at closing up wounds particularly for things like a, a laceration. Make sure your kit is somewhere where you can access it if you have been hurt and you're on your own in your workshop. Make sure that other people around and about you know where to find it. You might not be conscious. Somebody else needs to be able to get to that first aid quick, kit quickly and easily. If there are other people in your house, maybe get their first aid training as well. Or at least teach them the basics. I have two daughters. Both of them have done first aid training at guides. They know the basics of what to do. I've given them first aid training as well. It's something that we talk about. It's about being prepared. It is better to have first aid kit and first aid training and never need it than to not have a first aid kit and not have the training and find that you do need it. 